Chelsea fans clamored for the club to call Saul Niguez. And when the club called Saul Niguez, he answered. But how good can Saul Niguez be? What are his abilities, weaknesses, and how important will he be for the club? This is Saul Niguez's profile. And this is a perfect hat trick in Chelsea perspective presentation. Saran, welcome back to Chelsea Perspective. Yeah, thank you for having me back on uh, the channel. I'm really excited to, to get into Saul Niguez. It was a signing that as soon as we were linked to them, I wanted him straight away. I think he's a he's an excellent player. And I think this is the key to him rediscovering his his potential that he didn't really live up to in the last few years. And you can see by his social media post, he's posted already like 25 times since joining Chelsea. So it seems like he's really excited to get into it. And I think he's really, really perfect and the right play we need in that midfield. Yeah, I've been following his posts online. He seemed excited to be here, and hopefully that will translate into his uh, performance on the pitch. Uh, if that happens, uh, we can all be sure, uh, be rest assured that he will he will do well for our club. Oh, so Tyrone, can you please take some time and give us an overview of Saul Niguez's uh, history? Yeah, Sal's had a, a very long career already. He broke into to senior football at quite a young age. I remember in, in the 60, I think, 1980 season, we played against Atletico in group stages of the Champions League. He was only 21 and he scored a great goal past Tiba Courtois. That was kind of his, his big, big mark. In terms of history, I'll bring some up here. He was brought to the Real Madrid youth system, which is, is a big flex enough as it is from 2006, 2008. And then he got scouted and got signed up by Atletico Madrid in 2008. And I believe he was around 16, 17 years old when he got scouted by Atletico. And yeah, he started off in the Atletico Madrid B team, as in Spain, you know, they don't have the, the second division in Spain is filled with Barcelona B, Real Madrid B, Atletico B, a lot of other teams. So he was put through there and he made 70 appearances in three years for Atletico B team, scoring eight goals. And then, yeah, obviously after those great stats, he was promoted to the Atletico Madrid first team, where he, since 2012, has made 230 appearances. This is just in the league, by the way. And scored 26 goals. There was a short loan spell at Real Vallecano where he had 34 appearances. So each club he's been at, whether it's a B team, you know, first team Real Vallecano, he's done amazingly well. And now he's come to Chelsea at the age of 26 and he will be 27 in November. But yeah, he, he's had a very long career already. He broke into football at a very young age. And obviously it's not going to be such a linear kind of uh, perspective of going up. He's not going to have such an easy journey. There was bumps along the way. The last few years, he's had a very difficult spell at Atletico Madrid position changes, health issues, stuff like that. And yeah, he's he's come to Chelsea now to try and revitalise his career. And yeah, hopefully we can we can get that buyback option in the future. I mean, the, the option to buy, because I think he, he can do a real good job for us in the future. Yeah, I'm, I'm hopeful that happens. And, and that is that, that is quite a journey for Saul Niguez. And, and like you did mention, I think he's had a deep inform, uh, should I say, past few months or so. Uh, any ideas what happened to him? Because at uh, 17, 18, I think he was brilliant, you you could argue. But uh, of recent, he doesn't look like the Saul Niguez of 20, uh, seven, uh, 2017, 2018. So what happened? Yeah, just to start on quickly, 17, 18, that was really a massive, massive high in his career. He was scoring amazing goals. He was getting amazing assists. Like I mentioned, the goal that he scored at Sanford Bridge against Chelsea. He was really hitting the prime, prime times of his abilities, not as in his career, but the age of 21, it's very hard for players when they peak so early because it never really goes smoothly. Look at Marcus Rashford. When he first came in at Man United, he did amazingly. And then he had a bit of dip when Zlatan Ibrahimovic came in and when Lukaku came in. And now he's become their main player again. So it's never easy when you break in so early. I'm sure Kylian Mbappe and Haaland will experience similar things soon. That There will be some some dips in form here, there. But yeah, to go in a little bit of detail about Sal Niguez, how he's kind of struggled the last few years. He's become a kind of victim of his own versatility, to be honest, to bring up a quote of someone I spoke to who has close, to his close links at Atletico. He's been put left back, left midfield, right back at times, centre defensive midfield, Cam. And he's never really cemented a real position where he can he can make his own left. He's got to have a great range of centre midfielders. You know, Koke, Hector Herrera, Marcus Llorente, uh, Thiago when he used to be, and not the Barcelona Thiago, a different Thiago. So they've had a lot of players you can play that role. So then you think, Sal can play otherwise, so why don't we just shift him to the wing? That's really affected him in his kind of development in that system. 
because all of his attributes were being developed in the midfield role. And then they're kind of being, you know, his pace has been developed, different kind of stunts of growth to happen in these positions. And I'll just bring up his health condition quickly. He did have kidney problems back in 2018 where he came off at half time and he actually was shaking in the dressing rooms. He couldn't walk properly and he was dizzy and he had to be taken to hospital. And there was a real, real problem with his kidneys where he couldn't play properly. But, you know, he carried on playing straight after the hospital appointment. He kept on playing for a month through these issues. And he actually had to run off at half time, uh, sorry, full time after every game because basically he was peeing blood. He did have a massive issue with his kidney. So he has had to deal with these problems. Also, his mental health problems, he's had to deal with that for the last few years. That's been something I can't put my finger on it quite away, but there's been many reports that he struggled with, you know, the different position changes, stuff like that. Atletico doing the same thing season in, season out, being at the same club, trying to compete with different players under the same manager. It's not really healthy for the brain at times to have the same kind of scenery every single day. If you think about it, if you work, you know, every single day at the same job, literally every single day of your life, the same people, the same manager, it's going to affect your brain a little bit. And he has struggled with that. Um, but, you know, he's come to Chelsea and hopefully, like I said, he can revitalise his career because he started off so well. And the last few years have been kind of a setback in his life. So I really hope that he can really develop now and he can put all the things behind him and really turn into the player that he should have been in the past. Yeah, I, I, I didn't, I, like, never had, I didn't have, I didn't know he had a kidney issue and that is quite some uh, health issue for him to have overcome and continue playing. That's not easy. Uh, but aside from his um, health, uh, the health problem he had, uh, versatility, while it may help a player to always have a place in a team, it can be detrimental to that player's uh, career because uh, managers will often come to you to go, you know, fill in spaces where they mm -hmm. cannot fill in because of if they if they run short of personnel. And, and you know, yeah, it's a good thing. Versatility is a good thing. But it, uh, like I said, it can be detrimental to a player's career because, yeah, like, like I've mentioned already, managers will always come to you left back, right back, as long as you're able to, uh, you know, fulfill that role, they will always come to you. Now, let's talk about his um, abilities. Can you give us an overview of his abilities? Uh, what kind of a player he is overall? Yeah, if you saw the Twitch stream that he was he featured on the day he was announced the deadline day, he was kind of doing a kind of interview with the internet celebrity, a Spanish celebrity, and explaining. And the, the main thing that he summed up is he is a box to box midfielder. He can defend when he needs to. He can attack. He can score goals. He can make last, last ditch tackles. And that is what I feel is the player that Chelsea have been missing for many years. You think about it, Jorginho is a holding player. Kante, he is kind of a box-to-box, -box, but he doesn't get enough goals. He's kind of a destroyer. And Kovacic is just kind of that player in the middle of the pitch who can, who can break through presses. So we were missing this kind of player. His dribbling is, is second to none at times. He can break out presses. He can get out of tight positions. He can do a lot of things on the ball, maybe not to Kovacic level, but still to a good enough level. His passing has been, you know, very good when he first broke in in 17-18. He picked out great switch balls, great diagonals, great through balls, and he really assisted, you know, Diego Costa, Alvaro Morata, some other big players at Atletico when he was there. He got many, many assists for when he was on, when he was in his prime for, for Atletico. Yeah, his passing, his, his shooting is actually very underrated, I'd say. You know, we talk about a lot of our midfielders, we don't get enough goals from midfield. But Sal Niguez can really hit a great long shot. He can dribble through players. He can find the bottom corner. He can score goals and he can really finish at times. And I think that'll be a big benefit to this team. If we can add maybe five to seven goals from midfield, that can take us from second place to first place. So if you think about the kind of metrics and our dimensions, it is a massive, massive advantage. You know, his defending, I've watched a lot of highlights, a lot of compilations of his slide tackles. He's very, very good on, on the ground and making key, key ditch tackles in the middle of the pitch. And think about it, if we win the ball through the middle of the pitch, we then find Mason Mount, we then find Lukaku. That can get us a crazy amount of goals as well. So having that guy in the middle of the pitch who has great tackling and can do pretty much everything you need him to do. And that's kind of what I say. He has no real weaknesses. That's probably the best attribute I'd say. His strength is good. His defending is good. His passing, his shooting, his defending. I can't really pick out anything. Maybe his goalkeeping, but obviously we don't want to see Sal in goal. We have Mark Martinelli as a fourth choice. So yeah, we, we don't really have to see that. And I just think he's class and... I'm really convinced that he's going to really perform well and he is the missing piece in this jigsaw when Kante has injuries, when Jorginho has injuries, when Kovacic, who does tend to pick up injuries in the season, Sao can pick up this form and can really take this team to, in my opinion, the Premier League title. 
Yeah, uh, I, I, I agree with you that, I mean, he has some qualities that would complement what we already have, like goals, assists, and uh, long reach shots, which we lack from the midfield, especially goals. Yeah, Jorginho was uh, um, our highest goal scorer this past season, but all the goals he scored all came from the penalty spot. So from Saul Niguez, he takes long shots, like you mentioned already, and and that would be that's uh, great to see. Also, given that Angolo um, Kante, it's starting to look like he's injury prone at this point. So it's important to have somebody in the mold of Saul Niguez who can come in and and execute that defensive midfielder role very well, or other roles. Even he can deputize uh, for. Uh, Jojinho or even uh, Kovacic. So that's, that's, that is very good to, to see. So uh, I know you've followed him for a long time, uh, Tehran. What would you say are his uh, weaknesses? Like I said before, that is probably his best attribute. He doesn't have many weaknesses. And I, I would compare this to other midfielders. They all have significant weaknesses. Jorginho's pace, you know, we have to be honest right now. He is the UEFA player of the year, but he does have a weakness in that department. Kovacic in his shooting is a massive weakness. And Gola Kante in his fitness, I know that's not an attribute, but it is a massive weakness in my opinion. And Sal has a great fitness record and he has great shooting, passing, defending. Everything is so strong. But maybe one thing that I say is his consistency. And that's not really an attribute. It's obviously, you know, some games he can perform blinders, some games he can drop off and kind of ghost through the games. And this could have been because of the kidney issues, because of the, the facility changes. But if we want a Premier League title, we need to have players who can play to a high level for at least 30 games a season. And if Sal's not, you know, performing and doing one game here against Man City, then drifts out the game against Everton, he performs well. We don't need those kind of players, but that is very, very picking the straws right now. And I think at Chelsea, he won't be playing week in, week out. So every time he comes on that pitch, he needs to really put his stamp on the on the proceedings, put his mark on the proceedings, prove that he's meant to be there. You know, Thomas Tuchel, I've already seen a report from Adam Newsom of Football London that in Sal against his time at training already, He's really impressed the manager and the link-up play with Marcus Alonso has been really impressive. And yeah, I think the way I think of it with Sound Gears, I'm, I'm kind of going to go off weaknesses here. He's going to see this competition in front of him, Mateo Kovacic, N'Golo Kante, Jorginho, and he's going to really be motivated in seeing these three midfield. He's not going to be thinking, oh, I'm not going to get ahead of him. He's going to really want to break through and really want to get past these players, play as many minutes as possible, hopefully get a permanent transfer. And maybe, you know, next season, he could be playing for us permanently. So yeah, I say to summarise that quickly, his weaknesses are his consistency. But other than that, seriously, I can't think of many significant things that could affect us during a game. Okay, okay, that, that's, a, uh, that's a good highlight of his uh, weaknesses. Um, although it's not really specific. Um, no, you don't, you didn't have specifics, but I don't blame you because you, he's an all-round player and he's, he's, uh, he's great quality. It's hard, hard to find, to pinpoint... Um, uh, uh, let me say, um, weaknesses. But that's, by the way. Now, since you've followed him for a while now, how would you say he's improved? Uh, let's say from, from a health perspective, would, how, would, do you think he's overcome the health issues he's had in the past? And from technical uh, perspective, do you think he's improved? I saw the health problems. Yeah, he has improved. The kidney issues lasted for about a month. But uh, I don't know if he has long term kind of effects um, similar to you know a similar diseases right now. They kind of long term effects in the future. But I think he has overcome them. But my main factor of what his issues with Atletico were mainly the versatility that was causing him issues. Diego Simeone uh, was was maybe getting a bit. You know, if players play for the same club for so many years under the same manager, it does get quite stale. Think of Liverpool's front three last season. It did look a bit stale with Salah, Firmino, and Mane being together for so long. So, yeah, I think the main issue was is versatility. And from what I'm seeing right now, you know, training video stuff like that, what the manager's coming out and saying. I think he has overcome them and I think he's really determined to prove people wrong. And in all the interviews he's done on the Twitch streams with Chelsea TV, he knows that he's not been himself for the last few years. He's accepting it. Some players may have just ignored the fact. They just think it was blame other people. But he knows that he's not being great. He's going to come here and he wants to prove to people at Letico, people at Chelsea, people watching him, his family even, that he is the player that he was two years ago. And Chelsea was the perfect pathway for him to find this form, you know, we are the champions of Europe. We have 60 to 70 games a season. We have great midfielders that you can, you can compete with, you can make you play better. We have great forwards, great defenders. You can really enhance your abilities even more. 
So I think he's really going to come here and see this as a major challenge. He doesn't know the language. He doesn't know different factors about living in London. He's never been out of Spain before. Not that I know of living out of Spain. But I think he's going to come here and he's going to put all of his past behind him. And he's just going to be focused on the pitch, trying to impress Thomas Tuchel, link up with all of his guys like Alonso, Kepa and training and just really clear his mind out and try and get back to the, the right mental state that he was. Try and get rid of these men's health issues. Try and get rid of the, the issues with Simeone, the health issues. And really use Chelsea as a springboard to get back to the real Sal Niguez. Yeah, yeah, I, I, it is good to know that he recognizes that he's not been himself uh, for the uh, let me say past few months or years, if you like. Uh, and because the truth is that the most important aspect of solving solving a problem is to recognize that the problem exists in the first place, and mm -hmm. that's uh, great to see. So. Um, to the next question, uh, Tehran, there's always the argument that um, it takes one formation or the other to bring out the best in a player. In terms of uh, uh, when it comes to Saul, what, what formation do you think would be the best to get him, you know, to, to hit the ground running uh, when, he's, when he starts for Chelsea or whenever he come, whenever he plays? It's a difficult question because I think he can play amazingly well, similar to Lukaku in many different formations. But I think a midfield pivot would really suit him to, to a max. He can do every single role. That midfield pivot in the team needs to do everything, in my opinion. They need to run back. They need to defend. They need to assist. In my opinion, they do need to get goals here and there as well. That is just my personal thought. People say pivots don't need to do much. But if we want to win the Premier League title, our pivot can't just be lemons in the middle of the pitch. They have to be assisting, scoring and defending. So I think that pivot is perfect for him. In a midfield three, think about it, he has a lot more license to go forward, but he doesn't have to do everything. Defending is a lot less. Attacking is kind of a, more of a balance, but the engine room in the double pivot is so intense. If you think about Billy Gilmore when he came in last season, he found it so intense against Man City at home. You know, you can see the penalty. He found it really difficult. But I think Sal against his attributes really suit this midfield too. He can, like I said, he can defend, he can score, he can assist, he can do everything you need. Linking up with Jorginho could be could be a massive, massive asset for him. Jorginho could drop deep and dictate the play. Sal Niguez can destroy everywhere. He can score, he can assist. His decision-making is great. I think it could be a rule. Even under Kovacic, he could, next to Kovacic, he could do great. Next to uh, N'Golo Kante, he could do great. I think it would really suit him. A midfield three, I haven't seen much of him in a midfield three, but at Atletico, they did play a 4-4-2, and he used to play in the centre-mid role next to Koke quite a lot. And them two are quite technical players, and you'd think it wouldn't really work, but... The great balance that they had, it really complemented each other. They're not specialist players. They can do well in every department. Every, Like I said, no weaknesses. So I think in a pivot, you really need a player who can be an all-action midfielder. They can do all different kinds of the game. So I think at Chelsea, we do play a double pivot, obviously. So we'll see. He has said in his interviews that he wants to play in a midfield role. And he's been told that we'll be playing in the engine room at Chelsea. And I think it will suit him perfectly. And we'll see the real sound against come back because he has everything you need to do well in, in the system. Yeah, my, my takeaway from that response is um, I think given his attributes to score goals, take long shots, uh, long shots, and also I, I think the if you give him the freedom to go forward, that means you you you'd get the best out of him. He'd create more goals for us. He'd score more goals, and 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 he could start defending from the opponent's area. You would not have to defend from our own area. So, I, like I said, given his attributes, I think it would be best to give him the freedom to roam around the pitch uh, and also have a bit of a discipline to also support the team defensively. I think that will help bring out the best out of Saul Nik uh, Nikoi. So, so Tyrone, to bring everything uh, together, what would you tell the Chelsea fan that Sa Saul Nikoi brings to the team? Yeah, that's, that's a great question again. Um, all I say is he can do everything. That's what I've been kind of reiterating this whole stream. He doesn't have many significant weaknesses. He will play for his heart. He will try and prove everyone wrong. He will really play his heart and put his heart on his sleeve to do well for Chelsea. You can already see, like I said, a social media post. He is very excited to get on that pitch and prove people wrong. So I think we were missing a fourth midfielder. You think Ruben off the chic but I don't think his attributes really suited this, this double pivot system at all. It's too intense in the midfield with the kind of recovering of an injury. Same with, um, with um, what you call it, Ethan Ampadu. I don't think it would have suited him, in my opinion. So I think Sal Niguez was a player we were missing in that midfield. We needed a fourth midfielder. Think about how strong a midfield is now. We have three Champions League winners, a Euro winner, Kovacic, how many Champions League does he won? A Golo Kante World Cup winner. 
Saul Rodriguez has just come off the back of a La Liga win. He's won it twice for Atletico. I believe he was in the Spain squad. He's been in the Spain squad many times. I think 20 caps for the country or something. So he is the full choice midfielder right now. But he can easily break through. Don't think he's just going to be there to, to play you know, once every five games. He is there to provide competition and make Kante play better, make Jorginho play better, make Kovacic, you know, who does have someone nipping his heels now, really perform every time he gets on that pitch. So I think it is what we needed. You know, maybe if the season on loan is good, but it's not quite perfect. It's just a loan. Like, it's just a loan at the end of the day. We can get Schumann or Declan Rice, but the way I think of it is very similar to the Mateo Kovacic situation. We got him on loan for a season, then we paid the option to buy after his impressive spell. And I think he can be that player and we will sign him next year. So all I'm going to say is he's going to really provide competition to our midfield. He's going to make us stronger, make us have more depth in our squad. If we need a player, say just hypothetically, someone tests positive for COVID, someone tests, someone gets an injury, we have Sal Niguez there to, to come in. And we have such a competitive midfield now. And in my opinion, a title winning midfield, finally. Yeah, thank you very much for taking some time to explain to the fan base or whoever gets to watch this video how he's going to improve our team and overall what he brings to the table. So, so Tyrone, how important, I know this is very, a little bit similar to the previous question, but how important will Saul Neguez be for us uh, going into the uh, current season? Absolutely massive. You know, if we wouldn't have signed a forward midfielder, I would have been extremely worried. And purely for the fact that you've mentioned it, Coach Heller, Kante is an injury prone. And although we don't like to say it, and he's such an intense player, the intensity that he plays at, he cannot play it for 60 games a season. It's just not normal unless he's some kind of, you know, alien or something, which I'm convinced he is by now, unless he has some kind of extraterrestrial human body. It's not possible. So we can't expect Kante to play every game. Jorginho, you know, he needs breaks as well. He does play very intense. He's not the most athletic guy. I'm sure he does have the best stamina. So he probably does need breaks. Well, Mateo Kovacic, he has been known to pick up slight injuries and in training and, you know, the thigh injury he got last season. So it's very we needed a fourth player who doesn't weaken our midfield, who makes us stronger, who can play these games, who can push the players to do better. When players get injured, he can come in. And it's not like we're bringing the youth player to just fill in the role like Ampadu or someone else, you know, from our academy. I don't even Lewis Baker. We have someone who is a La Liga winner, a double La Liga winner. He's such a, a high ability player and he's going to improve us as well. So I think it's massive for the injury factor, purely for the ability factor as well. I think he will provide a different dimension to that double pivot. You know, I'm sure when someone saw N'Golo Kante maybe coming out of the blue and scoring a banger, they would have been like, what the hell? But now we have Sal, we won't be surprised when he scores crazy goals. He will provide a different dimension in my field. He will be a tenacious attacking kind of defensive, everything kind of tied together. So, yeah, we needed a fourth midfielder who can do all of this. And I just think on loan as well, it's such a low-risk signing, in my opinion. If it doesn't go well, we can send it back to Letico, as sad as it is. And, you know, we move from there, we sign a new midfielder. But if it does go well, we'll reap the rewards. We can get them on a, on a permanent deal. So I think it is a, a perfect signing. And the club have made a real decision. Think about the past. We needed a backup midfielder. We went to buy Danny Drinkwater for £35 million. Pounds. That was very, very stupid. But now you can see the club is getting more smart in this financially kind of side of things. You think our net profit is actually positive this year. We've, we've earned £30 million pounds in total, despite signing our, our record signing. So, yeah, I think it's been a great window for this club. And Saul Niguez is a great signing. Injury can, can fill in for injuries. He can do everything. He provides something different. Let's not forget about that. His goals midfield. And he also is such a low-risk signing. So, I think it was really important we got someone in. but We didn't have to just throw someone in who we don't really trust into the team. Yeah, uh, first I have to agree that the club has become savvy in on how uh, in their uh, transfer dealings, they don't just sign players. I think they do a lot of research these days before they go for a particular player. Uh, but that's by the way, uh, I was going to say something important that you did mention on how important it's going to be for the club going into the current season because we have quite a lot of games to play. And without uh, having somebody like Saul in the team, if any of our midfielders gets injured, then we're in serious trouble. But now I think we have numbers in that area. So should any of them get injured, uh, we, we, should, we should still be fine. And that, that is good to know. So Tyrone, let, let's go move on to his future now. Uh, um, I'm hearing, I'm not sure which is it, uh, the loan deal, is it with an obligation to buy or with an option to buy? 
is an option of 40 million euros. I believe that that is what's been reported by Nizar Kinsella of goal. It's not an obligation. You know, Atletico wanted that, but that was only when Sal didn't really want to join us. He was kind of stuck in between two worlds. But as, to, as soon as he made his interest known, the, the deal was made to an option to buy. And Atletico didn't really have an option to, to say no to that. So like I said, we can pay the 40 million euros, which I know you won't agree with this with me, Coachella. I don't think that's a lot of money for, for Chelsea Football Club. So, yeah, obviously, 40 million euros right now could make us all millionaires, but for Chelsea, it is not that that much. So I think it is a very low-risk signing, and we don't we need we don't need to rush with, with Sal Niguez. We don't need to force him to play well, like, say, Kai Havertz, Timo Werner last season. We can just embed him into the team, and he can perform, and he can be the, the real player that he is. Yeah, great, great response right there. It's a good thing that it's a, a low-risk signing, given that it, it is an option. So if he performs... Uh, as we want, then we'll go for him. If not, we say, no, we're sorry, it's not working out, and all parties will just go their way. And that is important to know. And like I've mentioned before, the club has become savvy with their transfer dealings. They don't just sign players for the sake of it. They do a lot of research, and they do it in a way that it won't be a big risk. And uh, hopefully it turns out good, because I really do like the player. And ladies and gentlemen, that is the player profile of Saul Niguez. So get in the comment section below and let us know if we missed anything. And more importantly, this has been the perfect hat trick and Chelsea perspective pre presentation. So I'll give it over, I'll hand it over to Tehran to tell us more about the perfect hat trick. And I will also provide the complete information on the perfect hat trick in the description section when I upload the video. Over to you, Taran. Yeah, I just want to say quickly, thanks for having me on. I know I do come to the channel quite a lot, but that's purely for the fact that I think you're a very good host and it's a very great, very great channel to, to appear you. on. I think your questions are very challenging and it's quite a unique kind of perspective on Chelsea, so I enjoy it. So yeah, the Perfect Hatcher podcast, we are releasing a lot of content in the future. One with Jay McIntosh, formerly of the Chelsea Social, now football.london so that'll be quite interesting to talk more about sound again in detail the real breakdowns of that move and yeah a lot of exciting episodes maybe one with cfc Pice in the future a lot of different chelsea episodes and kind of going off uh chelsea more premier league premier league kind of battles in the future as well so yeah looking to have uh some some exciting guests and yeah the the chelsea perspective and and perfect um uh, partnership is looking to really flourish in the future and i'm really excited to to develop it even more in in the future and really excel us and and really combine this partnership of knowledge, strength, integrity, and, and football. Yeah, thank you very much for taking some time to, to say that. And um, people, you see the man's uh, Twitter handle on the screen. And again, I will provide the complete information on the perfect hat trick in the description section when the video is ready. And please don't forget to go check out the perfect hat trick and you will not regret it. And more importantly, you will thank me later. And please don't forget to smash that like button, subscribe if you haven't, and more importantly, click on the bell notification button so you don't miss anything. And it is bye from me, Kachila, and my guest are on. See you guys next time. Cheers.